but growing up, you know, I was always told, you don't want to do that as a living, you know, to go get a real job and make money and, and do it as a non-pro and enjoy it, that, you know, it's a hard way to make a living, and it, it is, but like I said, it was my passion, and I'm a true believer that if you can make a living doing what you love to do, you, you're more likely to be successful, no matter what that is. The Converse Cowboy Journey has given me an opportunity to sit down with some amazing performers that are living the Western lifestyle, where it is my job to tease out their habits and routines so that you can apply and test yourself in your own life. I've learned, I've grown personally, I've been enlightened, and I've been humbled. Above all, I realize that there is no destination in this life, no goal achieved or money made that can replace the feeling of flow and the pursuit of doing what you love to do. With a growth mindset, I'm constantly asking questions and pursuing knowledge. The Converse Cowboy is a platform that allows me to do just that. I'm excited and eager to share their stories with you all. I'm Mike Roberts. This is the Converse Cowboy. Brought to you by Kerry Kelly Bits and Spurs and Schaefer Outfitter. For all of you horse fans out there, and I say horse fans, I don't say like specifically cutting, because if you're in if you're in any horse discipline, you've heard of the name Matt Gaines before. Um, one of the greatest cutting horse trainers and showmen that's in the business today. Um, close to nine million dollars in the cutting pen lifetime earnings close to nine million dollars in the ncha hall of fame in 1990s when you first won the futurity as a non-pro and you're one of three riders to have shown two horses to capture title of ncha horse of the year little little pepto gal and smooth as a cat you went on in 2015 to win a world champion on, championship on Special New Baby, 2016 Futurity Champ on second spot, marking a 229, and that's just skimming a surface on your success that you've had um, as a horseman and as a showman. Um, so I want, man, I've got so many questions, and I'm so grateful for your time to come in and sit down today and um, you know share some of the wisdom that you've learned along the way and uh, give people a glimpse into um, what's gotten you where you are today the successes the failures because people I say this all the time we always see the highlight reel but we never see the failure reel you know and anybody that's gotten to where you are is anybody who's done anything um, to achieve any kind of success there's always the stuff that nobody else sees and so um, I want to dive into some of that um, but first, you know, before we get into any of that, how's life treating you today, my friend? Good. No, everything's good. We're uh, just getting after it. We're hauling this year, so, I mean, it's been been pretty crazy. I think up until this last week, I think we've only been home, like, maybe 15 to 20 days all year so far. So it's been yeah. pretty pretty hectic, but good. It's been It's been fun, and... So far, it's been successful, and yeah, it's, it's been good. Yeah, that's good to hear. I got definitely, we're definitely going to get into that, you know, what hauling is all about. Um, when you hauled Special New Baby back in 2015, and then, you know, even today, what you got going on. But first, I want to back up and uh, take me back to the time you graduate from Tarleton State, and uh, you weren't a cutting horse trainer right out of the gate, right? Like so, no. you, you started uh, down the business road. I, I did. I graduated college, and uh, it was about that time that Dennis Moreland moved his his business in into Mexico. It was actually the move to factory where they made everything in Muskies, Mexico, and he had been talking to me all for maybe roughly a year or so prior to this and so we kind of set it up all along when I got out of college to go to work for him and learn the business and so that's what I did and I worked I spent a lot of time in Mexico at the factory helping and learning how everything was made and then I'd go to shows and run the booth and stuff like that at shows so I kind of got was involved in all different parts of that and and it was it was it was fun it was it was experience you know a good experience but kind of deep down I, I always always 
knew I wanted to to train horses. It's what I loved. It's it was my passion and but growing up, you know, I was always told don't you don't want to do that as a living, you know, to go get a real job and make money and and do it as a non-pro and enjoy it that you know, it's a hard way to make a living and it, it is, but but I like I said, it was my passion and I'm a true believer that if you can make a living doing what you love to do, you're more likely to be successful no matter what that is. And, mm -hmm. but you know, when it, like I said, when it's your passion, it's easy to get up and go to work every day because that's, that's what you love to do. So, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, so anyway, I tried that. I tried the real job thing and, uh, and it was a good experience and, but I, I think I stayed there about a year and I just, yeah, I, like I said, it was a good experience. I enjoyed it, but I just wasn't really happy. I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. So I had a guy from Coffeyville, Mississippi, call me out of the blue one day and he was looking for a horse trainer and I flew out there and met with him and we made a deal and I flew back and put my notice in and then matter of weeks I was I'd left Eagle Pass Texas and was moving to Coffeyville Mississippi to start training cutting horses <laughs> which at the time you know I'd shown a lot as a non-pro but I had never and and with my dad being a cutting horse trainer I had obviously worked a lot of horses started a lot of two-year-olds and worked three-year-olds and older horses kind of all along through the process, but I'd never taken one from start to finish and trained one, so I didn't even really know if I could. So that was kind of, you know, the, the first year I was there, that was my first goal, was just prove to myself that I could, that I could train one to go cut. So, you know, I mean, I really kind of started, you know, just like anybody else, you just got to go figure it out. Yeah, I think it's interesting, you know, and I think a lot of people do that, Matt. Like, we're, we, I think it's a form of social conditioning. What society tells us what we should do, right? Go to school, get a good job, make good money, and then it goes on and on, right? But I think society's got it backwards, and I think a lot of people are starting to wake up and realize that. And when you can find, and again, I only speak from my own experience, like, I did the same thing and went the corporate route, and and uh, hated it the whole time. Um, but I really do, I think when you th think about it mentally, like you get yourself, you get your mindset right, you know that I'm gonna do what I love to do and I'm in it for the long game. It's not gonna happen. I think that's the other thing. People, we live in this microwave society, people want instant success. Yes. And that should, that, that, that's not real, that right. doesn't happen. And you may be talented at one given thing, but there's gonna be speed bumps and things that come up along the way. So if you are doing what you love to do, you have a very strong why behind it, and it's going to push you through, you know, those those hurdles. And uh, and again, that's just that's my experience. But I think to your point, when you can do what you love to do, people see value in that, and you can make money doing it. Well, then you win. Right. The money really is just a byproduct of you being really good at what you do. Right. No, for sure. You know, um, I'm curious how many head that were you riding when you went to Mississippi. Well, so it was, it was an interesting situation, that, and a lot of people, if, if you saw the place that I actually started training horses out of, a lot of people wouldn't believe it. I mean, it was, it was not, it, it, was, it, it was nothing fancy by any means. It was, it was a pretty run down old place, no indoor arena, no covered arena. I mean, it was, you know, but it was a place that that I could start doing what I what I love to do. So, and and so the the job I had with him, he provided me a house to live in, and he guaranteed me two thousand a month. How old were you? Oh gosh, so I was that was like ninety three. So. 23 maybe somewhere around there okay uh young yeah yeah 
But uh, so anyway, uh, and and this guy he had he had a stud of his own that he, and he had a bunch of mares. So he I think he'd have anywhere from fifteen to twenty two year olds every year that that he would raise and then so how our deal worked is I would ride I rode outside horses too like for different people and I think when I first started I charged four hundred dollars a month for a horse. So so the way the deal worked is say if I brought in fifteen hundred dollars a month off the outside horses he'd make up the difference yeah, so that I made at least 2000 a month. And it was like that for a while. And because when I first got there, you know, like I said, I wasn't even sure I could train one for start to finish, much less anybody else. So yeah. I didn't have, yeah, you know, I had been somewhat successful as a non-pro at that time. Like I said, I'd won the non-pro futurity and some other stuff and on horses that my dad had. And, uh, so you won that, I don't mean to cut you off, but did, did you train that horse as a two-year-old, the one you won the futurity on? Well, I did about half the training on that okay. one. My dad, the other half. I guess. But, uh, so, uh, you know, so naturally I'm there and the guy that I actually took the job with, he didn't have anything that was very good to show. He had a couple older horses and I'd go show them at the weekend shows and stuff like that. And so for the first, oh, four to six months, it was pretty, you know, it, I mean, it was pretty rough because I just, I didn't, the horses that he had, they, they weren't all that good. There was a couple in there that ended up being decent. And, and after a while, I got a couple pretty good customers that had some decent horses and things started getting a little better. And there was a, there was a guy out there, he was a farmer, his name was Terry Toole. And uh, probably if it wouldn't have been for him, I don't know where my career would have gone. He was the first one, he came to me one day and he said, Matt, he said, we need to get you a good horse to show. And uh, so, so we actually, we go to looking around and Sam Shepard had a, a gilding, his name was Manalina Ray J. And we drive down to Sam's one weekend and try it, and and he buys him, and he'd show him in the non-pro, I'd show him in the open, and we started kicking everybody's butts on that horse. I mean, he was a good horse. And then, you know, so that kind of that, that kind of right? you know started turning things around, giving me more confidence, giving people more confidence in me, and. Mm -hmm. And so started getting a little better horses and things kind of built from there. It's kind of funny, my wife and I, like I said, we, for the last half of the last year and this year, we've been doing a lot of driving. So we were driving one day and she asked me, she said, out of all the horses you've trained, she said, what horse do you think's been the most influen influential horse in your career? And uh, I said, well, that's easy. And, you know, she's saying I was going to say smooth as a cat or knew I would or little Pepto gal or one time, you know, one of those. And I said, and she said, really? I said, oh, yeah, that's easy. She said, well, what, what horse? And I said, Manalina Ray J. She said, who in the hell is Manalina Ray J? You know, and, and so I told her the story. But, but it's true. If it wouldn't have been for Terry Toole and that horse, you know, I mean, who knows what, yeah. what would happen. But... Uh, and that's, man, that's such a good, that's a great point to like, I was just talking about with these guys, like show up consistently at the thing you love to do and doors will start to open. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big believer that, you know, and I think luck always plays a role, but I think, I think we create our own luck. 100%. And, you know, so, and, and that's what, like, especially these, these younger guys today that are trying to get started, man, it's hard to, it's hard to get some of them, like you said earlier, you know, everybody's looking for that instant gratification and they just don't understand, like, it's not how it works. Like, uh, you've got to, 
you got to show up every day and 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 work your ass off and and if and if you do that and then things will start you'll start creating mm -hmm. you some of your own luck and things will start turning around but it takes you know it takes that it takes showing up and and working hard every day and and trying to stay positive when it's hard to be positive and mm -hmm. i mean there's to me to me the struggles are what make you successful if you if you view the struggles correctly 100 percent. it's through your perception is your reality i mean you know i, I mean Losing always made me better. Mm -hmm. Because who wants to lose? Yeah. So, you know, when 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 things aren't going right, that's when well, and it, it exposes the shit you need to work exactly. on. Exactly. And and I and I think this is true about everybody that's successful. I don't care what what they do, but promise you everybody that's successful at whatever it is there was a time when things weren't going good and they buckled down and yeah. and decided that things were going to be different yeah and and that's what that's what you have to do and and then what we do for a living that never changes mm -hmm. i don't care how much you want or what your resume looks like it I mean, it's it's you better show up, work hard every day, and because if if you're if somebody else is, I promise you. Yeah. So right. you know, it, it never if as long as you're going to be competing and doing what you're doing, you better be a hundred percent plugged in, or yeah. or you're not going to be successful. And as uncomfortable as failure is, quote unquote failure, um, that is an opportunity to grow. Oh, for sure, you know, always. That is where the, when you come out on the other end of it, you look back and you're like, okay, I get it. Always. Get it. Um, I'm curious to know, in those early days, who were some of the, uh, who were some mentors, who were some guys that were giving you advice, who, who were the guys you would reach out to if you had an issue with a horse? Or well, I think, you know, obviously, my dad, because that's who I grew up with, initially learned from, but... Uh, and, I, and I was really fortunate because, I guess because of my dad and he, you know, he had been involved in the cutting horse industry and had success as a, as a cutting horse trainer. And so that opened some avenues for me to, to get to work with and learn from people at that time were some of the best. I got to spend some time with Shorty Freeman and and uh oh gosh he he was one of the main ones when i was younger him and my dad that i that i got to actually interact with working horses and stuff like that and have conversations with but but i always i would always watch and and watch other people and yeah. and and try to learn what I could that way and pick up. And then as I got older and actually started training horses for a living, I spent a lot of time with Paul and Winston Hansma. And, uh, and they, you know, so probably those four, my dad, Shorty and Paul and Winston are, have been the ones that were the most instrumental uh, in helping me develop as a horse trainer and uh you know and kind of helped me develop what my program ended up being yeah can you remember back to something specific that you were struggling with at that time there or something that you may have reached out well before? yeah there's a lot of things over <laughs> the years but but i'll tell you kind of a funny story so when i was 18 years old i went and i spent Oh, I don't, week to ten days with with Shorty, and Shorty and my dad were pretty close. They were really good friends, and so I took two three year olds with me, and I went and stayed with him. And and it this was it wasn't too long after that that Shorty got to where he couldn't ride anymore. So I mean, it was kind of at the end of his 
career and you know he ended up dying of emphysema and you know so I mean, he was already at that time on oxygen part of the time you know but but he could still ride and and train a horse and so anyway we'd work horses every morning and and then we'd go fishing in the afternoon we'd go his place kind of neighbored the crossing ranch and they had a, a decent sized lake on their place and kept a little boat over there so we'd go and shorty loved to fish so so we'd work horses in the morning and we'd go fish in the afternoons and while we were fishing we'd talk about training horse working horses and stuff like that <laughs> so it was kind of right at the end maybe the last day I was there with him he uh, we were out there fishing and he said, you know, Matt, he said, I've watched you work those horses all week. And he said, I'm gonna tell you, he said, you're you're really talented on a horse. He's, he said, everything you do, you do really well. But he said, there's one thing about you that puzzles me. And I said, what's that? And he says, well, I don't see how any of it has a damn thing to do about a cow. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like and I was like, what are you talking about? I, I'm working a cow the whole time. He said, no. He said, there's a cow in front of you the whole time, but you're not working it. Mm. And and it it's funny how it, it took me, I don't know, shoot, maybe three to five years to really figure out and understand what he was trying to tell me, you know, but but a lot of things to me were were that way when I was younger and learning about specifically you know, training horses you know I, I'd hear stuff people would tell me st stuff and you know and and I'd think about it and think about it and not really understand it and then you'd be working a horse one day and something would happen and you're like oh man that's what they're that's what they're yeah. telling me you know and 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 it's fun like I enjoy playing golf and 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 I I like to work at that too because I think the two things are similar and it it's funny like golf to me is a lot the same way you know it's I'll be hitting golf balls or something one day and I'll you know something will happen and and it'll just click and I'm like oh that's what they've been trying to tell me you know and so I mean I don't know maybe that's just the way I learned maybe I'm slow but but uh, I don't think so though it's like so I just got into cutting last year so I've been doing this about a year now in feel and timing. Yes. And and uh, so I'll, I'll go back. So I, I used to play I played baseball in college, and uh, I was an average baseball player at best. But my instincts made me a little bit above average. I would lead the team in stolen bases. I wasn't the fastest guy, but I could read stuff. Right. You know. And so that's what I'm learning about, and that's frustrating to me about cutting. I have no instincts. Right. Like right. I, I have a little bit of feel on a horse, but when you talk about relating it to a cow and riding to a herd, so my question to you is. How do you teach feel? You know, when you've had amateurs, how, how, what is your best way to teach feel and timing? Well, I, I, I don't. That's a good question. I don't know that there is a there is a real answer to teach feel, but I I believe that if I was to help somebody that had never cut before start cutting today i think the first thing i would do though especially if they haven't if it was someone who hasn't ever spent time around cattle because i think that's where the big struggle is is you know one they gotta learn how to if they don't know how to ride a horse they gotta learn how to ride a horse and understand the horse but the big thing about cutting is you gotta understand cattle mm -hmm. and so probably one of the first things i would do is maybe put them in a big ground pen with one cow and, and set a pen up kind of like a team pen and pen mm -hmm. and tell them look put one cow in there and you drive that cow into that pen mm -hmm. and figure out because i think that's one of the things people really struggle with like even with cutting is is how where they are on a cow how that cow reacts to where they are so you know if you want a cow to go forward you got to step back here to its hip and make it go forward if you want it to stop you got to step to its head and make it stop and so so to me like that's one of the first things 
a person needs to learn is where to be on a cow to get the response out of the cow that you want. Because mm -hmm. that's because when you go to because one of the things most beginner cutters really struggle with is is getting a cow cut and learning how to do that and 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 the reason they struggle is because they have no idea where to be on a cow and which so that's really important as far as getting a cow cut but to me also the most important thing in cutting is position because if you're especially especially today like the horses are bred so well today like you know most of them are are cowy and and smart so if, if you're always and i think in and we all have a little different spot on a cow we we like to be some people like to be a little inside some people a little more maybe outside a cow at times myself i mean my goal is to always try to stay even or maybe just just a touch outside depending Does it if, depend on the show the tent? well it depends and it depends on the cow the tougher a cow i'm going to kind of maybe stay a little more inside but but my goal is always i, I say even which even to me is basically my horse's head even with the cow's head and but i feel like if you if you do that as long as you stay so let's just say head to head with that cow well that cow the pressure from that cow is going to hold your horse in position mm. and if you go to cutting and you watch especially you watch that you know some of the amateur classes well so what will happen when a run goes bad is they'll get long one way well then they're immediately short the other way mm -hmm. well and then so and then their horse sometimes starts pushing up the pin or are falling off in the corner or maybe it quits well well all that happens because they're no longer in relation to the cow mm -hmm. and so that that's kind of how i see cutting is like the cow is the glue that holds everything together so as long as is your head to head with that cow everything stays tight your horse stays correct but when you start getting out of position well then that bond you know it gets weaker and weaker and weaker and then it finally breaks yeah so so that's you know to me that's the thing that that i think people need to learn first is what what that the relationship between them the horse and the cow mm -hmm. how all that works how a cow how a cow reacts to to the pressure they put on it and also how your horse reacts to the pressure you put on it and then the pressure you put on the cow and the cow puts on them you know i mean because that is all that has to work together in cutting to have a good run so you you have to understand that which I think once a person understands that, well then they, through learning that, they're gonna understand more of the feel, mm -hmm. is what I'm getting. No, that makes no sense. <clears throat> what impresses me though, is you feel that in a run, okay, I'm along this way, you make an adjustment like that, you know what I mean? Right. Um, so I ride, James Payne trains my horses, and so I'll go spend time with James, and that's something he told me early on um, and just because he told it to me doesn't mean I learn it or implement it. You know, application is typically the hardest part, but he's like, training horses or, or showing cutting horses is about the communication between you and your horse and your horse and that cow. Right. You know, and that, that is the most important part is the, between the horse and the cow. And um, understanding that conceptually, yes, I get it. Applying it, a little bit different different game you know well you know what what i see though and and i see it in most everybody like it's like you said a while ago you have no instincts well i'm on i'm gonna guess you have more than you think you do because i can watch beginners amateurs you know what however you want to label them, label them but uh but you go to a show and you can a lot of times see in their face like let's say they're short this is being the cow this being the horse well they'll know they need to be here 
like you can see it in their face. I know I need to be over there. Or when they're cutting a cow, they'll be like, I know I need to be over here, but they won't, they won't, they won't do it. They won't believe in themselves enough what they're thinking to do it. And that's what I tell all my customers and stuff, you know, like if you feel like you need to do something, do it. Yeah. Because, and, and if it's wrong, well then we can discuss why it's wrong. Yeah. But, but they need to learn. I mean, you, you've got it. Uh, most of the time your instincts are right. Like, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, you're smart enough to know if a cow's over here and you're here and you're wanting to stop it, you probably need to be over there. But it, it's funny how you, you, can, you can see that on people's faces a lot of times, but they just won't have the confidence to do it, you know? Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, if you think you need to do it, do it. And then if it's wrong, then we can talk about it. Because then if it's wrong, then I can teach you right, right. why it's wrong. Right. But if you don't do anything, how are you going to... Yeah. You know, how are you going to learn? Yeah. And so, so that's kind of, I mean, that's my feeling about it. I don't know. Some people may be different, but. Yeah. No, I, 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 I mean, I, I love the advice. And, um, that, uh, and as you're saying that, I'm thinking back to these lessons when James is getting in my ass about things. And I'm like, is this right? And I'm trying to do everything perfect, almost mechanical. Right. I was like, that's not a machine, dude. Like, you need to do what needs to be done. Done. You know, and as simple as that is, it's it's so true though. Like every situation's different with the cow, right. the horse, and so that's that's uh, again. I just I feel like I need more at bats and uh, just more repetition. Well, and that's yeah, and I mean, and that's really that's that's how you learn. You just you just got to go do it, and yeah. the more you you know, the more you do it, the the better you'll get, and and you'll you'll figure out one thing and you're like man i man, like i finally understand that and then you'll go show and something else will hit you in the face and you're like oh, yeah yeah now how do i deal with this you know <laughs> but but that's just the way it is it's how you gotta learn the more but, i feel like i learn the more i realize i don't know what damn the more you yeah the more you have to learn yeah, for sure yeah it's definitely that way i'll go back to when you're first starting like would you when you're going to shows and you're still trying to figure things out would you see what some other people were doing and think oh shit we're doing doing it this way uh, maybe i need to try that well so to go backwards a little bit like i said when i like that first year i started training horses professionally you know my first goal was just to prove that i could train one to go cut when I put my hand down and you know so kind of the way I did is is I so when I set out training that set of colts that was my number one goal and and I did that I had I think I had maybe four three-year-olds I trained and I showed them at some of those smaller fraturities out east and made some finals and might have even won or been second in a couple of those little fraturities out there and then but then when I started that next group, I would look at, you know, sit back and look at the, the ones I had trained that first year, and I'd be like, okay, so what do I need to do? What would have made these horses better? Mm. Like, I know I can train one to go cut now. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I've got confidence I can do that, but what, what would have made those horses better? And then, so I'd try to take, you know, what I did that worked and add what I thought would make them better yeah. that next year and and try to and try to be confident in that and see it all the way through because what happens to a lot of guys when they're when they're young and they're learning is that you, you gotta be real careful or you end up you know, you'll work a horse one way one week and then you work it in a different way the next week and then the next week you're doing something else. Well, before you know it, your horse is confused, you're confused. I mean, and, and there, there's got to be consistency. Mm -hmm. You know, you've, you've got to be telling that horse the same things every day if you're going to have a confident trained horse when you're done. And But, you know, I, I've seen people over the years that that you know they'll 
they might work a horse like Gary Bellenfont this week and then work a horse like Ronnie Rice next week. Well, both of them are successful programs, but they're different. Right. And, you know, so, and that's where people end up getting confused. And that's why, like, when I, when I was young and I started, like I said, I spent a lot of time with, with Paul and Winston, and, and I loved, I loved the way, specifically Paul's horses, I loved the way his horses worked. I mean, like, that was how, like, that's what I wanted to learn. I, I wanted to learn, you know, how to make my horses work like his horses did and and so i worked with paul a lot and being that him and winston worked both worked at bar h together i worked with winston a lot too and and what i learned like the the basis of of their programs were the same their horses didn't look the same you know to watch but but the the basis of what they did was pretty much the same. It's just the difference in application that made the the two horses look different. But the but the basic program was the same, and that's what I learned then. Is that so? I've always tried to work with, and even now, like when I struggle now, I mean, there's there's pretty much three people I go to to help, I and mean, that's you know Paul Winston and Johnny Mitchell, because I know. Like the, the basic program is the same. Mm -hmm. You know, what what we're all looking for is pretty much the yeah. the the same and, and that way I feel like so a young guy like find somebody you like the way you know, you like their horses and you think that's how you want yours to be and, and learn that program. It's not to say that you can't learn something from somebody else because you can. Mm -hmm. But you gotta be careful, you know, like I always try to work with work with people that have the same idea, the same basic principles or the same basic program. And that and that stays consistent. Now, you know, that being said, I mean you can learn stuff from other people too, but you just gotta be careful because, you know, if you get to changing too much stuff up, then you lose your consistency, and when you lose your consistency, man, then it gets tough. Right. You know, I mean, like I said, you end up confused, your horses end up confused, and you're like, well, hell, I don't know what to do now. So. <coughs> um, take me back to El Rancho and the Mercuria run on Special New Baby where you marked a 234. If anybody's never seen that, go check it out. It's on YouTube. It's got about 200,000 views, and it's badass. And uh, can you describe the feeling like, what was the feeling during that run that you had? Well, I guess to start with, I mean, that is just a phenomenal horse. I mean, I knew it the first time I rode her as a two-year-old. I called my wife and said, I think I just rode the best horse I've ever been on, and she laughed at me, you know, at the time. But, uh, but I mean, she's just a phenomenal athlete, smart, and and honestly that year it almost every run I had on her was a blast and she would seem like she would do something in just about every run that would make me go, Wow, how'd she do that? Mm -hmm. You know, and so but but it was kind of funny that run in particular that night Mike Wood, I don't remember now which horse he was showing that year, but he had, there had already been a few good runs. Mike went, and I think he marked a 227 or 9 or something, had a great run. Mm -hmm. And and I was deep, deeper, like I was maybe 7th out of 10 or something like that in that set of cattle. And uh, I remember... Tara, my wife, was got that mare ready, and so I go to get on her. The horse before me is going, and and she said she said something about you know how the cows look or something like that. And I said, well, I said I think there's 
I said, there's some cows in there left I think that are I can get a good check on. I said, there's a few riskier cows in there that if I can make it work, I, I think I can still win. Mm. And she looked at me and she said, look, Mike had a phenomenal run. Just go, just go get a good check. So I get on the horse and I look at her and I said, nah, I think I'm gonna try to win it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, and it was to, so to, to hear her tell the story though, it's pretty good because she's standing there next to uh, Todd B. Matt, who had gone a couple horses before me. Well, the, the first cow I cut in that run was a, a red bramer and uh, and it was a lot of cow. I mean, it was, and so as I'm, to listen to her tell the story, as I'm cutting that cow, Todd said, man, said, I thought about that cow, but said, I, man, I didn't think my horse could hold it, you know, and she's freaking out. She's like. And he's talking and, to you while you're riding. Well, no, he's, he's talking to my wife. Oh, okay. He's okay. standing there but next to her watching, you know, and he's like, so he sees which cow, you know, he can tell which cow I'm fixing to cut. And he's like, man, I don't know, that's a lot of cow. I thought about it, but I didn't think my horse could hold it. And uh, same way, I mean, I cut it. And and, and that was the, the toughest cow in that run was that first cow. And, I, and even when I go back and, and watch it now, how as tough as that cow was and how accurate that mare was and call i mean she never missed it right. an inch you know and 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 i i still watch it back now sometimes and i'm like man i i don't know that i've ever ridden another horse that would have that would have one been smart enough to hold that cow and had the athletic ability right to hold it as well right. you know and and then uh, i think the I think the second and third cow, she got to do some stuff that was, I know there was one deal there on that second cow that like she kind of laid us yeah, down on her belly her and her you know, and I mean, she got to do some stuff like that. But, but to me watching it back, that first cow was the most impressive to me because you know, I mean, I had a front row seat and I'm telling you that. <laughs> You know, that, that cow was a lot of cow, but I never, you know, I remember in that run, like I never felt like we were in danger of losing it. I mean, she was just that on that night and 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 she was a, you know, a phenomenal talent. I mean, I just, like I said, I don't know that I've ever been on another horse that, that had the, that was smart enough and the physical ability on top of it to hold yeah. a cow like that. Not like, like she did. I mean, make and make it look that good. So, right. so I mean, it, it was obviously a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah it looked fun. You've got a quote that I saw. It says, in a run, I want to get my horses to start the way they finish. And hearing you tell that story, it sounds like she, did she do that consistently? Like she would start how she finished the run? <laughs> yeah, pretty much, you know, and, and that mare, you know, she obviously, I didn't have as much success on her as a young horse as I did. You know, I mean, she was nine years old that year I hauled her. And, you know, so I mean, she was a lot more mature and, and she was, and even then though, I mean, like, like that, she was a high strung, high powered mare. I mean, she, and, and, and some of the things that made her great was, you know, were also some of the things that made her a little inconsistent as a young horse. I mean, she would have some great runs like that at times, and then she'd, you know, she'd kind of freak out at times, you know, like mm -hmm. squirrel, you know what I mean? Like, but, but, you know, it just, but as she matured mentally, you know, she just got better and better and, and, like I said, that year I hauled her, you know, at nine years old. As far as I'm concerned, I mean, I know I've never ridden a, a better horse. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't know that there's, that there's been one that was better. I mean, maybe there is, but, yeah. but I mean, she was pretty, at that time in her life, she was as good as any horse I've ever seen for sure. Yeah.
it's definitely impressive to see. And again, like if, if you guys haven't seen it, to any listener out there, damn sure go check that one out. Um, so, would you say that's probably probably one of the highlights of your career, showing that that horse at that show? Well, I mean, yes, I mean for sure. It's definitely not the biggest thing I've ever won that right. particular cutting, but but that I I think that run. Like you said, I mean, I, it still goes around on Facebook sometimes, you know, and people to read their comments on it and stuff. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And, and, you know, I mean, I know for as long as I'm alive, I mean, it'll always be a run that when I think about, I mean, that it'll be one that, that I think about first, you know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's definitely one that stands out to me and I think a lot of other people too. So, yeah. so I mean, yeah. And I, I mean, and I, I love that. I, I try not to get that attached to many horses, but that one I was, it I mean, like I, I, I love that I'm horse. Oh yeah. Other interviews you, you've done, it seemed like there was a connection between I'm, them. You know, there, I don't know. Uh, it was just, she understood me, I understood her, and there was a trust there that between the two of us, there was a run that I had on her earlier in the year in Las Vegas. It was it was at one of the Mercuria events and uh, in the go round. And my first cow I cut is pretty good. Like we started a good run, good enough to make finals. We'll, I go to cut my second cow and and there's another cow that I end up paired up and this other dumb cow won't like it won't go back you know and so I try like I don't know for how long but I keep my hand up for maybe four or five seconds trying to get separated and I finally I'm like if if I'm gonna have a shot of making finals I'm gonna have to throw my hand down and see what happens and and I do and we work the cow I was trying to cut with that cow other cow out there for probably 15 seconds before it goes back and she never misses it a lick that's why you know and 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 i end up i don't remember what they marked me at 21 or something like that i end up making it like finals. yeah barely you know but but i mean just like that right there i mean i don't know of another horse i could have done that on and you know, but but I but I mean I trusted her and right. and I and she trusted me and and it worked. You know, so yeah. I mean there was just there was definitely I think that bond between you know her and I there that's a little different than than probably most other horses I've had. Um, tell me this: Can, can you tell me a time? Or, or your most embarrassing moment in the show pen. Do <laughs> you have any of those? Well, probably one of them. I wasn't actually showing a horse. I was turning back. And that was last fall. I fell off my turn back horse there. <laughs> in the same arena I marked the 234 in. <laughs> I, I, I was turning back and I went to stop a cow and some, you know, the, where the, in that arena on the, off to one side there, it's kind of like big concrete area where everybody sets. They've got chairs and tables and stuff up there. And we were going towards that wall and I like go over there, try to stop this cow and turn it back the other way. And somebody moved up there or something and scared my horse. And I mean, he like just ducked right back out from under me. I did, I fell flat on my ass. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> and it, it was embarrassing and it hurt. I tried to act like it didn't hurt, but it hurt. <laughs> but so that's probably the most embarrassing in the show pen I've had, but I wasn't actually showing. But I mean, there's been, if you do this long enough, you're going to have some embarrassing moments in the show pen. I mean, it's going to happen. And it's happened to me more than once. I, it's the only time I can think of I fell off, but. <laughs> I still don't, you're telling me that, I don't believe it. Like, I can't believe no. your Matt Gaines calling out. Luckily, there was no video of it. I don't know how, <laughs> but there's nobody got a video of it. So, 
Otherwise, everybody, I promise you, it would have been on every social media deal. It probably would have had more views than Special New Babies Run, I imagine. <laughs> Um, tell me this, man. So I've been around this cutting game for about a year now, and uh, you said it earlier. Everybody in this game at your level, at the open level, works hard, right? Everybody's working hard. So I'm curious to know, in any field, in any event, whatever you're doing, what is it you think that separates the goods from the greats? It's the mental part of it, without a doubt, to me. It's... Uh, it's and and that's something that really intrigues me and I and I study it is I, I like to I'm and I'm not a big reader but I, I like to read stuff on anybody that's that's been exceptional or you know perceived to be the best at their mm -hmm. sport to know what 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 drives them, what, you know, what their their mental outlook is on things. Cause to me, that's what really separates the very best from everybody else. It's it's the mental side of it. And and there, you know, and there's a lot to that from, you know, what what drives that person to to want to be the best to what makes them confident about doing what they do and, mm -hmm. and because I think that I think that's one of the hardest things is in order to be great at anything you've got to believe that you can be great mm -hmm. well it's hard to believe that you're great that you can be great until you you know until you've proven that you are and you know so I mean it's kind of like you know, you've got to, you've got to believe that in yourself before anybody else ever, you know, and, and really before you believe it, I think, you know, I mean, or at least before you've proven it, you've right. got to, you know, you've got to tell yourself that, that you are good enough and truly believe it. And, and that was one of the things I, I was fortunate enough to learn kind of earlier on. And, and again, it was, I was talking with Paul Hansma one day about, you know, the whole mental side and he gave me he gave me a cassette tape and I, I think this guy's name was last name was Lair. I think it was John Lair Lair. Anyway, this guy was a tennis coach and it was it was all about uh you know the the mental side of things and, and how to you know, how to train yourself to be positive and just how you know your response to your verbal response to somebody saying you know like you know somebody says hey do good later or something you, you know is your response i'll try or you know and like and and it like kind of the basis of of this whole deal was like be positive you know say i will or mm -hmm. you know and anything like that be you know your response be positive you know with trying without trying to be cocky i mean like i don't right. you know i don't want anybody to think i'm cocky but but you know but it's amazing to me like because i worked hard like i was very conscious of it for a long time and 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 it's amazing to me how just through doing that being positive in your in your response to to situations and and things like that, man, it didn't take long. And I mean, and 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 before long, you know, I mean, you, I mean, you really start believing that, you know, somebody says, "Hey, do good," and you be like, "I will," and I mean, like, yeah. and and I knew I would, yeah. and I was that confident in it. And then when you go show, it's like you're not worried about anything. I mean, you just you feel that confident in and the job you're going to do and you know so i mean i'm a i'm a believer that you can train yourself to be confident and 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 be that be that person that you know that you want to be but you got to be conscious of it you got to mm -hmm. just like anything else you got to use it and you got to 
Yeah. You know, you got to really believe it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but it's, it's, uh, it's that, you know, same thing. You, you got to believe in yourself before anybody else does. And, yeah. but, but I think it's, I think it's those kind of things that, that the people that are the very best at their sport or whatever it is to me, it, that's the difference. Yeah. And that seems to be the consistent answer that I get um, from folks like yourself, you know, and, and there's very few things in this world that we can control. Our mindset is one of them that we can, you know, and so whether there's a few quotes that I lean on, like whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right, you know, and, and also we become what we think about, and I'm not going to get too woo-woo here or get into metaphysical, but it is the law of attraction, you right. know, you do become what you think about, and um, like... Gosh, I've listened like to other amateurs, and they'll, they'll talk about like scheduling hotels, and they're like, "Well, I'm only going to schedule it to here in case I don't make the finals." I'm like, "Fuck that! I'm yes. scheduling it through Sunday." <laughs> like, I, yeah. there's no doubt in my mind, even though I may not like that. I can't tell myself that, you right. know. And uh, I think it does. Like, it, it it means so much more, or it has a it, it's. Um, so much more impactful than we think our human mind is so much more powerful than we even get it give it credit for you know and, and by default for what and it's evolutionary right like by default we worry and we have fears because we had to survive once upon a time you know and so well and i think that there's you know there most people are negative i mean really i mean if you look at it and and because of that, like, they want you to be the same way. And, you know, and, and you can, and without somebody like purposely meaning to try, you know, trying to drag you down, I mean, you can be around people that'll drag you down if you're not careful. And, and, I, and I try not to, as much as I can, try not to hang out with people like that, one. and. You know, but but two, even when you when you are, you know, in that situation around those kind of people, I think you've got to even be more diligent in in what you're thinking and and your thought process and and stay on track because there's, you know, it's it's easy to be average. It's hard to be exceptional, and. So there's not many people, there's not even many people, I think, that even understands what that is and, and for sure how to achieve it. Mm -hmm. and, and it takes work, it takes effort, and it takes doing the things others aren't willing to do, and that's a big part of it, mm -hmm. is, is learning, training yourself to, you know, to be positive. If you're gonna go to a show, just like you said, if it's a week long show and the finals are at the end, why would you not reserve a room all the way through it? Like if you don't believe you're not gonna do any good, why would you go in the first place? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's kind of funny, like over the years, you know, when you train horses for the public, sometimes you gotta show horses that aren't that great, you know, that mm -hmm. it's just the way it is. We all have to do it at times. and. You know, and it's like in the past, I mean, I'll be working a horse and I'm going to show and my wife's like, like, man, that horse looks terrible. I can't, why, you know, like, I don't even know why you're showing it. I'm like, look, people that own it want me to show it. I got to show it. And you've got to let me believe that it's good enough. I Like deep down, I know yeah, it's right. not, but you've got to let me believe it is. Otherwise, I have no shot. Yeah. You know, so like, I know it doesn't look that good, but like... <laughs> Just act like it does, because that's what, I mean, that's what you gotta do. I mean, I've gotta believe that I have a shot or otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna do any good. And, right. and, and sometimes, like I said, I mean, sometimes you'll do a good job and, and it'll all work and you'll make finals and everybody will be like, wow, how do you make finals on that horse? You know, well, I mean, you gotta believe in it. You gotta, yeah. and that's, and, and I think that's, it, and it's hard in what we do. I mean, it's kind of, it is a lot like baseball in that, I mean, it's, you know, you're going to have some rough times. 
it's not going to be a base hit, a home run every time you, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it's a very humbling sport. And it's, if you let it, it's real easy to get down on yourself. And, you know, so you've got to, I mean, I, I've, I mean, I'll go back and watch that run of special new baby sometimes, you know, just to like, look, you know, you can do like, yeah. you know, you That's know what you're cool. doing, you know, and, and because, you know, like I said, I mean, it, as hard as we try, we all, we all are going to struggle at times, but, but you've got to, you know, when you get to that point, you got to do whatever you got to do to work through it. But, but the big part, to me, the big part is don't, people will try to distract you and get your mind, you know, plant seeds of doubt in yourself and you, you know you just got to try to be strong enough not to let that happen and stay mm-hmm. stay focused on 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 what you're doing and and be diligent about keeping your mind trained to be positive because i i mean i'm a true believer that's that to me that's the difference and the the best and everybody else yeah. It, yeah it really is and again so many people have said it i agree with you and i think you said it perfect a minute ago awareness like having an awareness around that you know and I like the analogy you can tell me what you think about it Um, it's like our brain it's conscious and subconscious it's a lot like training a two-year-old right like before we throw a leg over that two-year-old like it's wild and running free and scared shitless you know and doesn't really know much and our brain is no different it's kind of running on default you right. know, like running on the hard wire that we were born with unless we're conscious enough and aware enough to take control of it and can consciously navigate and tell it what to think about with our environment who we surround ourselves with what, what the input is what we're listening to what we're letting in what we're blocking out and uh, i think it's a lot the same with the two-year-old the more consistent you are with that cult the more they're going to do what you want them to do um, and willingly, right. you know? And so I feel like the subconscious, we can train the same way. Yeah, and, no, I agree. And, uh, and I've seen, like, I felt it, I've seen it. And, and, and I've, I've sat down on the show before with a um, sports psychologist works with the Boston Red Sox and Chicago Cubs. And those guys have somebody high. Each team has a guy, you know, to go over that stuff, to go over visualizations, visualize what you want to see too often i think we worry about what we don't want to have happen right and inevitably that's, that's what, what happens yeah happens, you know? that's, and, what, that's what i like i don't even remember where i read it or somewhere but it was a quote or somebody somebody asked because what was they said like babe ruth would strike out what, 10 times for every home run he hit or something like that and at least yeah. and somebody asked him one time like you know what do you think when he struck out and he said well i think i'm that much closer to my next home run you know i mean that's <laughs> you know so i mean like how more positive can you be than that you know and that's and like to me one of the the greatest examples that most of us have got to watch is tiger wood i mean back when when he was pretty much unbeatable you know and even other golfers would talk you know they call it the tiger effect or whatever you know i mean i mean that guy even when he was struggling he knew he was going to beat you when he was at his best yeah and and i mean and that's i mean and and the other golfers believed it too like he had a bunch of them beat before they even teed off because yeah you know he was that positive yeah in himself and you know, so like, I mean, I think he's a great example of. What's uh? Tell me this, like, I'm sure folks are curious to know, like, what's going through Matt Matt Gaines' head? Um, you know, what at what point? I know we've had you on the show before, and I know you mentioned visualization before run. Um, so are you doing that like in the practice pen weeks before, right before show pen? What are some of the practices you're doing well, to get I, your mind right? I pretty much always will run through run through my my run just you know fairly quickly maybe it might be like right before they bring my set of cows in or something but i will go through cow by cow just you know it's kind of like 
I'll just kind of talk my way through it, like make sure, make a clean cut, stay even with the cow, uh, like don't quit the cow until I know for sure it's turned away or dead stopped. And, and I'll go through that each cow just to kind of get my mind thinking about my job. Because the way I look at it with cutting, like there's, there's variables that you have no control of and those I don't even worry about. Like I can't, I can't control who's judging. I can't control the ground. I can't, you know, I can control what cows I cut, uh, you know, but I mean, that's an educated guess. We don't, you know, I mean, you never know for sure what a cow's gonna do till you cut it. But, but so I try to focus on the things I do have control of. I, I have control of, if I get my cows cut clean, I have control of, if I have any raining points in that process, I can control to uh, my positioning to a large extent, making sure I stay in the right position where I don't have any misses. I can control whether I you know, switch cows on a cut or a hot quit or, you know, all those things I can control. So those are the things that like I run through, I run in my mind, like, you know, make sure, look, do what you need to do, stay in position, get the cow in a good spot, you know, and, and make sure when it's time you step up there and get a hold and control of your cow. And, and then, you know, and run through, and then I'll be like, you know, and make sure once you get it cut, put your hand down, stay even with that cow everywhere. And when it's time to quit, make sure that cow's, you either see that cow's butthole or it's dead stop before you quit. And, and then I'll go through the same thing on cutting the second cow and all the way through till the buzzer and just, you know, to make sure my mind, you know, I'm thinking of all the things that I have control of right. that it's fresh in my mind so that I, I mean I feel like I'm ready to go show. Can you remember back when you first started doing that using those visualization visualization techniques? Yeah I don't remember when it was I I actually first started doing it but it was a long time ago I mean like so you've been doing I mean, it a while. long I mean probably I don't know that I was I mean, doing it when I was showing as a non-pro, but but yeah, long. I mean, I've been I've been doing it for a long time now. I mean, pretty much from I'd say at least from when I first started training professionally. I got you. Um, we talked about this a little bit before we started here, and. Uh, it's one of those things like we see the highlight reels, we see all of the successes that people have, but one thing we never see is the failure reel, right? Like we never see um, the downs, you know, the dark times that, that people go through to get to a $9 million lifetime earnings. Do you have a favorite failure? And what I mean by that is like something that it may have sucked at the time, but when you look back, you're like, oh shit, that's why, that's why that had to happen. So maybe a well, perceived failure that led you you know to where you're at now well I, th I think all of them have led me to 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 where i am now and and there will be more in the future that'll lead me to where i'm at down the road somewhere you know i mean that's just the way i'm so this doesn't really answer your question but it, it's kind of some insight to my thought process and the way I look at failure and things that, so, so when I turned my non-pro card in, um, the first cutting I went to, Greg Welch used to, when I showed as a non-pro and stuff, he helped, he used to help me all the time, like turn back for me and stuff. and. So, I mean, and, and we were always, you know, fairly close as far as that goes. Like I never spent much time working with him or anything, but I mean, he turned back or he liked to pick on me and all that when I was a kid. So, so I turned my non-pro card in and the, the first cutting I went to after I did that, like 
when I first saw him, he came up to me and he said, what in the hell are you doing? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, why would you turn your non-pro card in? And I said, well, I said, I can't really afford to do this as a non-pro and it's what I really want to do. And I said, be honest, I said, I really want to know if I'm good enough to do it professionally or not. And he looked me square in the face and he said, you're not and you never will be. Mm. And I thought, well, you son of a bitch, I'll show you. Yeah. You know, and, and I mean, and, and I've just kind of always been that, that kind of person, it, like, if 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 I if it's something I I'm serious about, and somebody tells me I can't do it, I'll prove that I can do it. Yeah. Like I've just, I just I mean I just have that type of mindset, and you know, and I, and I'm the same way about failure. I mean, like when when I've had you know runs that maybe were good that uh fell apart or you know or whatever happened and you know when when i have when i failed at the time i mean i treat those the same way it, you know like like i'm better than that and i'll i'll and i'll work you know i'll work hard to to get better like i used to say and still do some like you know to me if you have the right attitude failure will breed success if you're not careful too much success will breed failure you know and so you know it you can get you can get to a point to where you know it's hard to get to the top but it's harder to stay there mm -hmm. because everybody's gunning for you and you know and and when you're trying to get to the top everybody's pulling for you but then once you're there you know then everybody's kind of sick of you and yeah and you know so you kind of you feel like getting there you got a lot of people working for you and you know and and, and rooting for you and stuff like that and then once you get there it's kind of like well you got a target on yeah, your back yeah, now yeah. and <laughs> you know so uh so i mean you know you got to learn to deal with that but you know so i mean it's just i, I just think you've got to have the because you're going to have failure mm -hmm. and you can either pout and whine about it and you know which i mean i'll do that some too i mean like you know you're going to be upset i mean nobody likes to lose and but but then you got to sit back and and look at it and say all right so what do i need to do to make sure that doesn't happen again like like i don't you know i don't want to be here again so so how do i move forward and then you go to work and you yeah. And, and you and you do that and it's kind of like one that I can think of the year I, I don't remember sure what year it was but the year I showed I'm counting checks at the maturity when I quit my second cow I mean it's I'm probably going to the lead in the maturity finals and I go to cut my third cow and I end up fresh cow I'm trying to cut and there's a rerun cow that that ends up out there too and the way it all worked out I probably should have cut the rerun and I probably could have got it cut clean and you know if it's a good cow then you know I, I probably win the cutting or have a real good chance to but I don't I try to cut the fresh cow I end up paired up instead of being first or whatever, I end up third. And I remember, so we go to, uh, we go to eat. I think we were at Papa Do's down here after the finals and uh, one of the judges came by the table and they said, you know, you could have died in the herd and we'd still let you win the cut. And I'm like, you know what? I don't, I don't show that way. Like mm -hmm. I, like I showed the win, I did what I thought was the right thing to do at the time and right. and it didn't work you know i mean and and that's the way it goes and you know you just gotta you brush it off and go on i mean yeah i mean i was sick at the time but yeah. but you know what are you gonna do i mean like i mean i and 
and and I think that's the way. To me, there's there's one way to show a horse. You show to win, and you and you got to do what you think is right at the time, and you got to believe in it, and you go do it, and and it's going to work. And sometimes it doesn't, and when it doesn't, I mean, you know, you got to look at it and say is. And like, and even, and, and I mean, there's been runs when I didn't do good where I screwed up, you know, like, I'm like, man, I don't know what I was thinking. And, you know, I didn't do my job the way I should have. And that happens, but, but there's also times where your run didn't go the way I wanted to, to and I, but I look at it, I'm like, you know, look, I cut the cows I wanted to cut. I got them cut clean. I did everything I could to give myself a chance and it just didn't work out. And you know, and sometimes it's that way, and that's where, you know, those are the times to me that you've got to be, you've got to look at those and say, okay, so what do I need to do different next time? What do I need to to do to have a better result? But but you you got to be careful, like you don't you don't want to let those times make you start doubting yourself, right? Because you know it, it's real easy to go to let something like that gets you in a slump uh -huh. and you know and so I mean you and you don't want that to happen I mean you just you gotta to me look at it learn what you can from it and and move on and you know what go to the next one hell these days I mean there's so many cuttings most people don't remember who won the last one anyway right. no matter what it was so <laughs> You know, it's kind of a what have you done for me lately deal, right. and so you know you just you just got to learn from learn from those and and do the work it takes to to do better next time and move on. Yeah, yeah, that's something I, I struggle with and work on, like not focusing on not focusing on an outcome or the result, but what was the work I did before? What's the process, and what is this is still the process? Well, and I, I think what you said there. And, and that's something I do a lot is, and I started this a long time ago too, because I used to, you know, when I was a kid, you go to cutting and they give cool stuff away and you're like, man, it'd be cool to win that and all, you know, and like, I don't, hell, like, I, I hardly ever even look at a payout or any of that stuff anymore because, you know, the bottom line, if you go do your job, the results will take care of itself. So like I don't I don't even I try not to even let any of that other stuff enter my mind because it doesn't matter because if I don't do my job it's not gonna matter what they give you mm -hmm. and you know and so so I mean like focus on doing your good job go do the job the best you can and the results will take care of themselves and and you know. And I'll tell you this, since I started looking at it that way, I've won, I won a lot more. You know, because, you know, the, our minds are crazy. Like, you know, some goofy shit can come in your head out of nowhere that you're like, why in the hell am I even thinking that, you yeah. know? And, and so, you know, that's what I learned. Like, the, the more, and, and what I really started working on is like, so, when they put my cows in, I'd block every, everything else out. When my cows come in the arena, I don't think about anything except what my job is until my run's over. Mm. And, and in doing that, I'm giving myself the best chance to win. Because, you know, there's, that's that's all that I'm focused on is my job and like I talked earlier and I, I break down what my job what are the things I can control mm -hmm. and that's what and I try to do those things to the best of my ability and I feel like if I if I do that I've given myself the best chance I can to win and then whatever happens happens mm -hmm. but but if I if I can if I control everything I have to control if, if I do that the best I can, then I should have a good result. And so to me, those are the things I focus on. And, and I try to, you know, you can't stay that locked in like 
24 hours a day. You just can't do it. But there's, there's a balance, right? Right. You've got to have a healthy balance, and I believe every individual is different for what that balance is. But but I would, you know, I do. I am conscious though too, like even especially it seems like the maturity because it's so long and like hell the first go rounds like seven days long and you know so I mean there's a lot of time just sitting around and you know and like I said goofy shit can float into your mind and I am like and I work too like if something like that some kind of negative thought or something floats in there I mean I'm quick to like I'll turn to something yeah. positive you know and not like and like don't let like i try not to even let that stuff yeah. enter in my head anything that's you know a negative thought or distraction like that i i, I as, as soon as i notice it i'm quick to you know i'll turn to something positive and yeah because you just i mean that stuff it, it gets in your head and I, I know it like it sounds crazy to a lot of people but but it, it affects you. It makes a difference. Oh, 100%. It'll, those small things can get in there and fester, you know, yes. without awareness like you're talking about, without a reframe or a recalibration, it will. It'll just grow and manifest in these stories and narratives that we tell ourselves. Oh, then, yeah. then become our reality. Reality, you know, and yes. And can get out of control. So um, I'm glad to know I'm not the only one. <laughs> no, well, and like I said, I mean, I think anybody that's successful, I mean, they... I don't. Maybe some of them don't admit it, but I'm. But anybody that's that's really successful, they're strong mentally. Oh yeah. And oh, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the the very best I've seen is. Uh, I don't know if you know Ted Noose at all, but man, that guy. I've gotten to know him some over the last few years, and and like he's a friend of mine on Facebook, and like. I mean, he's. Who, who is he? What is he doing? So, so he was a he was a world champion bull. Or he was he won the world bull riding back in I don't know was it eighty nine or ninety. Like he was PRCA bull rider and rode in the PBR some there back early on. And okay. I mean, he's older, retired now. He's got two sons that are rodeoing. And but like you know, it's it's good for me because. Like I said, he's always putting motivational, positive stuff, you know, yeah. on Facebook and all. And like he's, you know, he's very like I think he's the most positive guy I've ever been around in my life. It's pretty amazing. But I mean, he's, you know, to me, he's a he's a good example for somebody to follow. Like he mm-hmm. is, I mean, he is very big on on staying positive and and the the whole mental game and. Yeah. You know, because like I said, I mean, I believe, to me, it's the difference. It's the difference in, in the ones that are exceptional and everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. All right. I've got a couple more for you. I'm curious, and I'm going to shift gears on you, Matt. So you've been in this NCHA game for a long time, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> curious to know, like, what has changed the most since you started to now? And then also, what do you think needs to change to make the sport better? If you think, it, if, if in fact you think it um, could get better, um, what do you think that looks like? So the first question was, what has changed? Yeah. Oh, I think the the biggest thing that's changed is the the number and quality of horses overall. I mean, there's just, you know, there's there's a lot more really good horses these days, and there's a lot more really good trainers and showmen mm-hmm. these days. I mean, just, you know, to me, that's the, that's the biggest difference I've seen over the last, you know, of course, cattle have changed too over the years, but, and they will continue to change. In um, what way? Just, you know, they're just, to me now, they're, they're tougher than they used to be. And they're, and I think that goes to, you know, some of, you know, the kind of cattle we're raising. And, but a big part of it is how they're handled now versus the way they used to be handled is, mm-hmm is a big part of it but but the, the biggest thing to me and it's it's why like 
you know, used to you go to most of these age events and you can mark a 216 every go around and you're gonna make finals. Well now, you know, that's not even gonna get close most places you go. You're gonna you're gonna need a pair of eighteens or better to to make finals and that's just because there's you know, there's just so many really good horses and so many people that can that can get them trained good and show them good. So, I mean, it's just gotten a lot tougher because of the mm -hmm. the number of quality horses and, and quality people training them. Uh, that's probably the biggest change I've seen over the years. And then as far as what needs to change, I think there's probably a lot of things that that could be changed. But, but I, I really believe that For, for our sport to be able to grow past where it is that, that we as competitors need to change, need to be willing to, to change things that, that are, that are hard, hard for us to let go of a little bit. And like, and mainly what I'm getting at is, you know, what's the most unattractive thing about cutting? It's the cattle settling. You know, I mean, 30 to 45 minutes most of the time, and, and like nobody wants to sit there and watch that. And we, you know, there's better ways to do it and, 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 and cut it down to where it, it doesn't take any longer than 20 minutes and things roll on. And, and, you know, we actually, a few years ago, we were, pre-settling all the cattle at the aged events and I actually thought it was working good but you know the a lot of people didn't think the cattle were quite as good or whatever and you know or they couldn't read them as good and, but but like to me it's it's things like that I mean we we need to we need to figure out how to you know cut down some of the dead time in our sport and give us a chance to I think if we can do that I think then we have a shot of getting more outside money because I mean here's the you know everybody says it's not a spectator sport well I to me yeah you're right the way it is right now it's not but but I think as good as the horses are today like it could be mm -hmm. if if it was presented the right way I mean most people like horses mm -hmm. and and you like and most people that like horses have to appreciate what some of those horses can do and it's fun to watch I mean you know that uh, you know but but it's not fun to it's not fun when you've got to sit there for 45 minutes and nothing nothing happening you know what I mean like and yeah. so I mean like I think we've got to learn to streamline some things make make some of it a little more of a production and you know what and yeah maybe sometimes the the quality or you know the cattle may not be as good or whatever but you know what we're still gonna find a winner and so suck it up and yeah and but but you know if you can do some things like that and and our sport grows to where we're not just cutting for our own money all the time it's worth it yeah and and i think there's ways to do that but but we've got to be willing to let it happen right. right and you know so you know that that's one area i i think it could change I, i'm a believer too like and we get we were close to getting this done a few years ago but but i think the you know the whole deal of most of the most of the aged events we go to uh, people can show as many horses as they want about the only ones that don't and you know the futurity you can show too I think the super stakes and the derby and the five six year old you can show four 
in the four-year-old you can show three if one's a gilding but basically everywhere else we go you can show as many as you want mm -hmm. and and I really think that that and I don't know what the exact number is maybe three I, th I think you shouldn't be able to show more than three in any division but it would have to be that way at every show right and then you kind of you spread some of those good horses out and you get more people involved which is a good thing mm -hmm. uh, you know we're always working on leveling you know this new leveling deal we got going on and new classes and all this stuff will if you spread some of those good horses out the leveling will take care of itself mm. you know what i mean i mean like i mean and i believe i'm a believer in that and then i think that leads to some other things too i i feel like that like i think one thing cutting is missing especially and this kind of relates more to the age events because we we kind of have it in the the weekend stuff and and we really had it back when we had the Mercuria stuff going. You know, the, there's something for people to follow. I think people, you know, like you look at NASCAR and golf mm -hmm. and, you know, like I guess golf, they have the FedEx Cup and NASCAR, mm -hmm. what is the Winston Cup or whatever, you know, but, but, you know, so they're, they're getting points all through the year and, you know, and, and like, especially in our age event, like there's really nothing to follow, it's just, you know, we have this show and then this show and then that show and and you know, we have our horse of the year race, but then there's no you know, but even that, like people follow it a little bit, but there's no finals to it or anything like that. And I think there's a I think there's an opportunity there to you know, I don't know if you tie it to the horse of the year or, or what, but I think there's an opportunity there to, you know, maybe during the during the maturity one night you have you take the top 30 four-year-olds or whatever throughout the year and whether it's points or money however you you tie it up and and you have a a cutting that night that determines horse of the year or, or whatever or whatever you want to do and I, I mean I think something like that it's you could get a sponsor for somebody to put up some serious money for it because in doing that you create a like as a sponsor they can get a year's worth of advertisement yeah. and have you know and, and it all comes down to one night one run and and all that money can go to that one cutting because all these other age events are happening anyway so you know what i mean so i mean i think there's i think there's a there i think there's a way there to have a real a really good paying cutting at the end of the year that you know i think if it caught on you know maybe you don't even have to pay an entry fee to enter and i mean like you might not win i mean i think there's an opportunity there to have a cutting at the end of the year that you qualify for that that could pay some really good money and 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 it gives it and you give people who who like cutting you give them something to follow and you and you do you know there's so much social media now the nowadays and you know you do specials on these horses and stuff that's one thing i learned the year i hauled baby and my wife would put stuff on Facebook and stuff like that and really created a following just, and she put stupid stuff on there like me feeding her a cookie or like scratching her butt right? or, yeah. you know I mean? She could put a, a cutting run or, or a picture or something like that on there of us winning somewhere and that might get a thousand likes. She could put a, a deal on there of me scratching her butt or or like she would lay down in her stall and like she you could go just lay down with her and lean back she'd put her head in your lap you know stuff yeah. like that and she could put something like that on there and hell it'd get 40,000 likes you know what I mean yeah. because people can relate to that That's right. That's right. and 
and it was crazy so like as the year as we got further in the year like i remember we weren't even going to go to the congress because i didn't think i was had a pretty good lead didn't think i needed to but we got like phone calls text messages messages on uh facebook or is baby going to be at the congress you know so we decided to go because yeah and then and then i happened to win it and and they had it set up to where the ncha had some t i think they had like 75 t-shirts they were you know so they give the awards and they were they had some of us trainers there stay and uh well, I had won it, so I had Baby in there to get pictures and awards and stuff, and Tara was hauling Baby, and well, there was a line of people to get, you know, T-shirts, and then people would sign them and stuff like that. Well, so, and, and Tara's just kind of hanging out there waiting for me to get done, holding Baby, letting her cool off. Well, like, one of the first few people that came through and got a T-shirt they walk by and they're like, hey, can we get our picture taken with you and baby? And before you know it, like there's a line out the door. Like they see people getting their picture taken with baby and like they run out of t-shirts yeah. in 15 minutes and there's still a line like, everybody's like, screw the t-shirts. We want to get our picture taken with baby, you know? And, yeah. and, I, and it was like a real eye opener to me like, you know, just the stuff that she would put on Facebook, like, baby was a celebrity, you know? And, and so, I mean, like, there's ways to do things to create more interest. Right. And, you know, that's what that taught me. And I was like, you know, I think there's something there we can tap into that that could really help our sport, but, but you know, we don't do it. Right. Why do you think that is? Like, well, well, I, I think there's, I think there's lots of reasons. You know, one, I, I feel like we have too many shows. You know, I mean, we get, we go to, I mean, there, you know, like I said, I'm hauling this year, going to weekend cuttings all the time. But, but you know, you pretty much stay on the road all year, just going to age events too, and mm -hmm. and. You know, and everybody's busy going and showing and trying to get the three-year-olds trained, and you know, and it's it's like we're we're all kind of running ourselves ragged, and and I, you know, I think it kind of goes back to the streamlining thing. Like I look at it, I mean, to me, it'd be better if we had eight or nine really good age events a year that paid really good that you could make more special instead of, you know what I mean? And, you know, but it's just kind of, you know, it's the way things are and everybody's scrambling to try to make a living. And, yeah. and when you're doing that, it's, you know, who has time to make it change? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, and, and, you know, and then I guess there's always, you know, the unknown too. It's, yeah. You know, you Fear. people have to believe it. Yeah. It's going to be better before it gets better, and yeah. Yeah. so. And we could back that. I, that that's a whole other podcast, really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it really is. Um, I've got I've got a few more for you, then I'll turn you loose. So I used to do what's called a rapid fire, but nothing was rapid about it. <laughs> so I call it a slow fire round now, and it's brought to you by Ghostwood Distillery, and. Um, I'll start out with this one, and uh, if you could if you could go back in time, Matt, hypothetically speaking, and live for one week in any time period, when would that be? And it's more than one week, but you know the the year that I hauled baby, that was I mean that was just that's maybe one of the more special times in my professional life, anyway, that I can remember just because of the you know that horse and and my wife and I you know together and, and working together and all year you know the the work it took to to make all that happen you know it, it was it was a pretty special time to me yeah yeah so I know you travel a lot for shows 
But what is one place that you've never been to that you'd love to visit? I'd like to go in, in the United States. I'd like to go to Montana sometime. I've never been up there. No shit. Yeah. I'd like to. I'd like to go to. I'd like to go to Montana. I think. What part? Anywhere nah, specific? No, nowhere specific. I just remember as a kid they used to have some. Uh, seemed like every summer they used to have like a week or two worth of cuttings, and I think it was Big Timber, Montana. Okay. And I always thought it'd be cool to go up there to, you know, those shows and stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's got to be beautiful. Oh yeah. And uh, you know, but to be up there in the summer, I always thought that'd be a lot of fun and. Yeah. and get to see a lot of pretty country but yeah so that's that's the one that jumps out at me you know right yeah. off the top right on um if you could if you could have any three-year-old that you've trained back either because you would do some things different or because they were just super talented which horse would that be Oh wow! Well. Uh, so yeah, you've ridden so many. Like I get it. it, it it's a tough well, one. I think t I can think of two, and the reason for two is so I had a three-year-old. I don't even remember what year it was. Um, that most people, his name was Cowboy Cadillac. It was a stud. But, uh, Jeffrey Matthews bought him from Farron Hightower. And that horse, oh gosh, three or four weeks before the futurity was an outstanding horse. And uh, I don't know, somehow he ended up hurting a stifle and, and he just never was the same after that. But like if I could go back and have that horse and him stay healthy, I would like, I mean. How was he bred? You're gonna ask me that. <laughs> uh, I'm not. I think he was a highbrow cat. I don't remember for sure, to be honest. But uh, but he was that that horse was an exceptional horse before he got hurt. And if I could have him back and him stay healthy, he's one I'd like to have back to to been able to show through the you know all through the age events because. Yeah. I think he could have been a, a big time horse. And the other one was probably I'm counting checks. Just that horse was so, you know, one, he was he was tough at times training him. But but once we started showing him, that, I mean, he was probably day in and day out. He was probably as good as I had, you know, all through that period of time through his age events. He was just. Uh, he, you know, and he was another one I, my wife and I had a, you know, pretty strong bond with. I mean, he was, he he was just one of those, one of those horses that, that I felt like from the very time, first time I showed him to the very last time I showed him, I felt like every time I walked to the herd, I had a chance to win, you know, so, yeah. so I'd have to, I mean, throw him in there because of that. And I got to mm -hmm. say the other one, because that's a horse that, most people, you know, don't even know, and right. and and even the ones that do know him, there's not many that that truly knew how good a horse he was or could have been. Right. I got you. Um, for folks that may not know you, would you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert? <laughs> uh, I'm probably I'm probably more of a, an introvert, uh, but. I'm a, to me, I think I'm, I think I'm probably a person that's, that's harder to get to know, but once you know me, like I'm, I'm, I'm very open, I'm very, uh, but I'm not, I'm not a, like, I'm not a person that, like I don't want to feel like I'm bugging people, you know. So I'm not a I'm not a person that's mm -hmm. like big to go, like just approach somebody and yeah. you know and and start a conversation. But uh, but if somebody wants to come, you know, talk to me, 
you know, except, and this is where it's a little bit hard. You know, at the, at the shows, you, you know, you've got so much on your mind. And, and like I said, and I'm a big, you know, big on the mental side of it. And and I, I know during, during the shows, I'm not, I'm probably even more closed off because of, you know, with everything that's going on and the long hours and, and I'm trying to stay focused on on my job and stuff like that. But, you know, so I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd say most people would probably, the people that don't know me would probably say I'm more of an introvert. The people that have gotten to know me pretty good, you know, might think I'm, more, I'm not so much, but. <laughs> right on. Um, I got a new one I'm gonna try out on you. Um, tell me what the last thing you Googled was. It was probably some kind of uh, golf training device, probably. <laughs> 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 or, or video about how to have a better golf swing or something, yeah. probably. <laughs> well, I haven't got to play much lately, but I, I, I like to even like, I enjoy just hitting balls, like e even like I keep a net and my clubs and all with me in the trailer and like if we're going to be somewhere for a matter of days i'll set a net up and like if i have time i'll go out there and hit balls into the net just because i think it's good like it gives me something else to kind of break the monotony up think about something else a little bit yeah. and, and you know and i just i enjoy it kind of gives me something else to focus on that that really, like I said, I can relate it to what I, it's kind of funny, I can be hitting golf balls sometimes and and I'll, something will happen and I'll, you know, it's usually more on the mental side, but I'll think, you know, I could be more that way with my horses, you know, yeah. and but, cause I, I kind of tie the two together quite a bit, but. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I don't, I hadn't got to play, actually play golf that much lately, but, but yeah, I'll try to hit a few balls every day if I can just to, you know, just cause it's something I enjoy, kind of gives me something else to focus on and yeah. and stuff. So, man, I, I uh, that's all I got, man. And I really appreciate you coming by and dropping some wisdom on me and, and everybody that's going to listen to this. Um, I wish you luck this year. I know you said you're hauling, um, so I wish you luck the rest yeah, thank of the year you. and look forward to seeing you down the road. Yeah, no, it sounds good. It's been good so far. Hopefully, we can keep it going. Right on, my friend. Well, good luck. All right, thank you, sir.